So, uh, very happy to have you again. For those who are watching, full abstracts and biographical details of all the presenters and such are available uh, on the web page. Uh, for those of you who haven't become members of the SHE News and Resources page, uh, please do sign up as soon as you can because all the stuff to do with the conference and the next workshops will all be running uh, through that page. And without further ado, Bruno. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andrew, uh, first for organizing the workshop and mm -hmm. Sarah also for putting together all the things needed to make it happen. Um, <clears throat> my paper today uh, proposed to look at one of the peripheries of the medieval Persianate world, world, more precisely about Anatolia in the 13th century, a period when the peninsula was, under, was a border region between Islam and Christianity, but also was under a process of Islamization that started in the 11th century and will continue all the way up to the 15th century and arguably even beyond that. Now, um, the region was also stratifying different levels of, of political influence. Firstly, and especially after 1243, the overlordship, overlordship of the Mongols of Iran uh, in the region was at the top of the scale. And secondly, the defeated uh, by the Mongol Seljuks of Rum uh, continued in the area as subjects to the Mongols and created another layer of, of political authority. And these Seljuks, in turn, uh, on occasions confronted and also uh, allied, depending on the circumstances, on the political circumstances, with uh, Mongols officials in the region, in the region, for example, such as the Parvane and his family, with a lot of interest in the area, <clears throat> and also with different Turkmen tribes that control different areas of the peninsula, uh, especially in the border regions with Byzantium. My talk uh, today is centered on a particular manuscript entitled the Fustat al Adala fi al Kabaid al Sultana, uh, a Persian prose text composed in 1283-84 by an unknown author. The text was produced for one of these local Turkmen rulers, Musafir al-Din ibn al-Jureb, uh, the ruler of Kastamonu, which is, you can see, uh, the region there on the northwestern parts. Harif is also over Sinop and, and Changiri uh, region as well. <clears throat> um, ruled this area at the, in the late part of the 13th century, from the 1280s all the way up to 1293, this uh, local ruler, when he died in battle, um, in now, the only surviving manuscript of this work is held at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, uh, Supplement Turk 1120. But uh, the work was uh, the only copy we have is from the uh, 10th century Echira. Uh, 9, 990 Echira was copied, so 300 years after the composition of the work. Now, this is a complex text, uh, but it contains an interesting description of, uh, in a part of it, an interesting description of a group of people generally address or refer as mendicant or antinomian dervishes. In particular, the text refers to the group uh, popularly known as the calendars that Lloyd mentioned uh, briefly before in his talk, uh, although in the text don't, are not called calendars as such, um, but, but they refer to them and I will explain a, a bit more, <clears throat> who, um, as I will try to show, were an interesting uh, subaltern uh, group in the 13th century Anatolia. Now, for reasons of uh, time constraint, I will not get into details on the codicological features of the work, uh, nor I will all the manuscript, and I will not go into any details about the controversies regarding the dating of the, of the work, or the copying, or the authorship of the manuscript, um, which I have tried to clarify somewhere else, but I think for this workshop it's more relevant that I will speak about uh, the contents of the description of, of these calendars. So I will briefly introduce who these calendars uh, and in the secondary literature, what we know about them, just for those not familiarized with the calendars, and then I will go into the description in the Fustat al Adala, and I would like at the end to make a little comparison of a particular anecdote for it with another source to show um, a few what I think is relevant uh, depiction of these calendars. So, the calendars. Before uh, getting into the text, I think it is useful, as I said, to look a bit into those not familiarized with the history of mendicant dervishes to say something about who these were, these calendars. The origin of the term is not really clear, but it seems that uh, the earliest use of the word is in the Rubai of Baba Tahir Uryani in the uh, 11th century, um, era, and uh, in a short treatise uh, entitled the Kalandar Name uh, by uh, Abdullah Ansari. There are some uh, versions of the term coming even from Greek. I'm not gonna get into this uh, debate on the terminology itself. But uh, Karam Mustafa in his book has, uh, has a little mention to this, so you can look at that. Um, these so-called mendicant dervishes were far from a homo homo homogeneous group of people. Uh, but in general, they all share an extreme ascetism, an advocacy for poverty, mendicancy, itineracy, celibacy, self-mortification, 
and uh, a diversity in the degree of eremitic and cenobitic lifestyles. Now, the general depiction of them uh, can be seen in this portrait, also included in Kara Mustafa's book of a Timurid period, uh, depiction of calendars, with the characteristic that Lloyd mentioned of shaving the head and the, and the beard. Um, now, the calendars are not the only group of dervishes that appear in Anatolia Peninsula and Iran in this period. Others, such as the Nons and Haidaris, Shamsi Tabrisis, Jamis, also emerge in this period. Sharing the characteristic, these groups of speaking mostly vernacular Persian, and what seems to be a reaction to the high Persian use by urban elites in 13th century Anatolia. Uh, this has been interpreted as a way of presenting themselves, these uh, calendars or these mendicant dervishes, as representatives of the representation of the beliefs, frustrations, and, um, and the discontent of at least a part of the subaltern strata of medieval Anatolia society. I do not mean to suggest, though, that there is a rigid division in Anatolian, medieval Anatolian society between a high Persian, uh, like a mainstream Sufi urban society, and another one rural, um, vernacular Persian and, and mendicant dervish, as you know, Kuprulu has suggested, and other Turkish scholars as well, uh, but rather the more diverse uh, map of, of the different, uh, of Anatolian society and religious terms. There are, for example, indications of calendars being very active in Konya, uh, for example, and very close to the Mevlevis even uh, in the late 13th century. So they were not only rural dervishes, but also were active in cities. Nonetheless, uh, in the 13th century, I think these mendicant groups emerge as a subaltern ascetic uh, movement to uh, confront the more hegemonic <coughs> religious establishment represented by the ulama and a to a certain degree by mainstream Sufism that has been presented in, uh, well, present in Anatolia for some time now by the 13th century. So uh, I think they represent a subalternity here, and I will try to show in the description. So the work in itself, the Fusat al Adala, is a difficult, it's difficult to be defined uh, in, terms of, in terms of literary genre, um, or belonging to one literary genre in particular. On the one hand, for example, it has a, a big part of it is uh, Transcription of the Siyas Nama uh, of Nisam al Mulk, for example, which will clearly make it into a mirror for princesses, but also includes sections on pre Islamic history, uh, descriptions on, on different ancient heresies, on the Ismailis, on the origin of the Ismailis, for example, and goes into details on describing these innovations in Islam or free thinkers, uh, uh, Sindik, for example, and which normally are associated with Islamic tradition, in Islamic tradition, to heretical movements and heresies in Islam. And also there is, for example, a, a section which is basically an argument about how similar, from his point of view, from the author's point of view, um, Hanafi and Shafi ideas of Islamic law are. So, so a very diverse text with different parts of it uh, putting together to, for this Castamon of the ruler of Castamon. Now the section on the calendars, uh, which are called Chowlakian uh, in the text, cover mostly chapter four, and it's divided into these six sections you can see, so on the syndic of our time, they behave as much in the old ones. That means in chapter three and two, he goes back into describing earlier uh, manifestations of, of heresies, and so try to you know, um, make it now in the present day, in his present day, try to connect to those. Uh, on the practices of the Jolakian, or the calendars, on the emergence of the, of the calendars, uh, on the calendars themselves, so these, these sections are not very distinctly clear. And then it's the fifth one, is the one in which he makes this, um, argument on commanding good and forbidding evil, like blaming the, trying to tell what a good Muslims should do in front of these uh, heretics, and, and then an epilogue at the end. <laughs> now, uh, the intentions of the author uh, become clear in this short passage I will uh, read for you. Like the purpose of writing this chapter of the book is that any Muslim who reads and studies this book will benefit from the stories, news, advice, sermons, and chronicles of prophets caliphs and kings and their behavior and conduct, and that they will draw a lesson from the stories of the syndics and heretics of previous ages, from which people will take an example. As for such people, the syndics or the heretics who live in this age, so in the 13th century uh, Anatolia, he, the good Muslims, or the reader of the text, should regard them with contempt and despite. And when he knows some of these stories contained in this book, or from this book, he will easily understand their situation and comprehend their words of speech. Some syndic and heretics of our day that have appeared now 
uh, know of their conduct and behavior at, at deeds of innovation and heresy. So they, they, he claims that they are aware of this heresy itself. As a clear from this passage, the Fustat Aladala makes an effort to represent these mendicant dervishes as deviations uh, from the right path and treats them as an obscure part of society that is dangerously expanding and gaining adepts in 13th century Anatolia. <coughs> in doing so, however, it offers some unique insight into the beliefs and practices of these dervishes. Firstly, they are, these dervishes are depicted as including people with a variety of creeds, with some of them worshipping planets or the firmament, uh, Falak Parasti, uh, or the sun, Aftab, the moon, Macht, and nature in general. Secondly, the text claims that they had contradictory philosophical views, and whereas some of them, um, of the members, support the notion of uh, tatil or, sh or stripping gods from all attitudes, others advocate for anthropomorphism in Islam. Similarly, classical Kalam controversies over free will and predestination seem to also have been present among them, if we believe the account uh, of the Fustat al Adalla. Uh, it is impossible to be certain precisely how much theological knowledge uh, uh, there was among these, these calendars or of these dervishes describing the Fusat al Adala, but this description suggests a certain degree of concern for theological matters and a mix of Islamic and pagan practices among the members. Kara Mustafa has already suggested the in inherent opposition between the Sharia and the practices of these dervishes. The same opposition is expressed in the narratives of the Fustat, which is especially preoccupied with practical aspects of calendarism. The author complains that people is being easily influenced by the behavior of these innovators. According to the Fustat, they skip the daily prayers, namas, uh, break the fast during the months of Ramadan, drink wine and use cannabis, sabsak, all practices that are being increasingly followed by Muslims as a result of the lack of religious guidance and moral control of the ulama and the secular rulers, who he blames for all this sudden appearance of these uh, dervishes. The use of intoxicating substances and its spread in the region is one of the major concerns of the Orso of the Fustat. There is a short but a specific uh, argument uh, made against the usage of cannabis, for example, among Muslims, claiming that it was prohibited by the Prophet Muhammad himself and quoting some hadiths uh, about this, also adding, uh, illustrating his point with offering some detailed description of the effects of the substance in the human body, like uh, depression, uh, hallucinations, trace illusion, amnesia, etc. Uh, the preoccupation of the author uh, of the Fustat in trying to prove the haram nature of cannabis, for example, seems to have been a response to the a debate in Anatolia happening in this period of the usage of these substances, which seem to have become widespread together with the mendicant dervishes. In fact, in Batuta, for example, confirmed the consumption of cannabis in some regions of Anatolia in the 14th century, specifically in the region of Sinop, also controlled by the ruler of Castamono. So, uh, um, a century later, uh, when, when oh, yeah, 60 years after uh, this was computed, in Batuta confirms the same practices very close to the, to the region where the work was composed. In the second section of the chapter, folios 51a to 51b, there is a severe uh, criticism on the behavior of the calendars, claiming, for example, that these services allow dogs inside the mosque and use cannabis and alcohol inside the buildings. The author claims that they uh, pray in bands and stables and do not queue in the mosque to do the namaz. In fact, this rebellious act of not queuing to enter the mosque is emphasized in the narrative several times and seems to be an special concern of the author of the Fustat. On the one hand, this was one of the most evident practices of the calendar as it surely provoked public tension between the dervishes and the other Muslims when they were attending the mosque collectively. On the other hand, it reflects a subversive behavior of these dervishes who publicly confronted the norms of the imams and the hegemonic religious classes by, dem by demonstrating in this way an important component of ideological individualism characteristic of these mendicant dervishes, as has been noticed by Karam Mustafa as well. So they oppose this individual uh, attitude towards religion that going without queuing and going out of the communal practices and they were seen as subversive by the rest of Muslims, or at least that's how we portray the, um, the Fusat al-Adala. Although perhaps ex exaggerated, especially regarding with the use of alcohol in mosque, it is interesting that the description of the calendar practices contained in the Fusat al-Adala are in accordance with the sources describing mendicant dervishes in Anatolia and the Middle East up to the 16th century. 
like they already mentioned in Batuta, other European, European visitors left records of their extravagant appearance and behavior. For example, the Spanish ambassador to the court of Temerlan, Ruy González de Clavijo, who died in 1412, encountered these dervishes entering the city of Erzurum, and the Italian merchant uh, Barbaro in the late 15th century left a short anecdote of his encounter with a man in the city of Mardin who was uh, naked and shaved in the way of the um, calendar dervishes. So the text appears to reflect a faithful description of the later called calendars. The tone of this uh, of the section is one of the nouns condemned and even concerned regarding the beliefs and especially the subversive practices of the calendars and their progressive growth among the peoples of Anatolia. I would like to spend a bit of time now looking at how the subversive aspect and the hostility of the author of the uh, Fustat permeates from the narrative of the Fustat and the description of a particular anecdote. Now, uh, for that, I will compare it with another text that uh, Lloyd mentioned, is the Manakir of Sabi. Like other groups of this kind, the calendars, a story of origin or how they came about is contained in a hagiographic work produced in the 14th century known as the Manakir of uh, Jamal al-Din Abil Sabi, written by uh, Hatib Farisi. The work is uh, was well known as the Life of Saints and written in, in, in poetry in Persian around 748 Hijra, so 1347-48, providing a description of the life of Jamal al-Din Sabi, the alleged founder of the calendar services or rather the one that is credited for providing the calendars with their identity marks that differentiate them from other antinomian Sufis. Now, Jamal al-Din Sabi died in 1232, so his hagiography is written over a century later. This is not surprising, but rather the norm in hagiographic literature, where the, uh, the author are generally two or three generations younger than the founders, and I no, normally never met them. So this, this, this the accounts of their life were never, they are not uh, like uh, present witnesses. Um, what is surprising is that the accounts contained in the Fustat al-Adalla on the life of Savi and the corresponding section, uh, which correspond to section three and four of the uh, chapter four that I showed you before, precedes the, by 50 years, the official hagiography of the calendar. So the Fustat al-Adalla was written 50 years before the hagiography of the calendars. In this context, the Fustas offer an interesting opportunity to contrast two different versions of how the calendars came about. One being the official version produced within the calendar circles, calendar circles in the 14th century, and the other a hostile description of the life of Savi made by a representative of the establishment. The first striking aspect that emerged from the comparative is that the two versions narrate a very similar correlation of facts and events. For example, both agreed on claiming that Savi spent time in Baghdad and then moved to Damascus, where he lived under the spiritual tutelage of Shaykh Uthmani Rumi. At some point in his life, both works mention that one, of Savi, uh, one day Savi retreated to the grave of Bilal Habashi, one of the companions of the Prophet, in order to meditate in isolation. It's in this place when he is visited by a mysterious young ascetic who will be the res responsible for his adoption of calendar practices and beliefs. There's another also anecdote also, the one that Lloyd mentioned about these women coming and that's why he um, he cut his hair and eyeballs, but it's also this anecdote where he did it in the presence of this ascetic. According to uh, both versions, it was under the influence of this mysterious ascetic, and it was in the presence of Savi, in, in his presence, sorry, that Savi decided to shave his head and eyeballs, two of the distinctive sides of the calendar dervishes. However, when looking at some of the details in the narrative, the representation made by these two different texts divert. The more hostile Fustat al-Adala claims that it's in that in this meeting with the with the ascetic, uh, Jala, uh, Jamal din Savi share uh, cannabis and or again cannabis and wine with him, uh, with his new companion. Something that is obviously omitted in the Manakib of Savi. Another example of the different depictions of the calendars can be found in the role assigned to the Sheikh of Mani Rumi, which is different in both texts. The Fustat al-Adala, in the final lines of the section, the narrative suggests that the Sheikh tried to bring Savi back to the right path by uh, attempting to convince him to leave those ascetic practices and return with him to Damascus. Yet when he saw him uh, lost, like Savi could not be uh, brought back to the right path, he, the Sheikh uh, gave up on him and then in a sort of a radical change of tone, he beat him with his shoe and banned Savi for coming to his Awiyah ever again and all his followers. 
as expected, the official hagiography uh, of the calendars assigned a much more sympathetic role to Savi, stressing his virtues in this moment, and commitment to poverty and, secular, and, and seclusion, and contrast, contrasting them with the less pious and more accommodated position of the mainstream Sufi Osmani Rumi. What I think is interesting here is that this opposing perception of Savi reflects a clear opposition between a certain religious group in th to certain religious, uh, between certain religious groups, sorry, in 13th and 14th century Anatolia. On the one hand, the more uh, mainstream, uh, the more, sorry, the more uh, hostile view author of the Fustat, who after all is producing this text for the local Turkmen ruler of Kastamonu, tries to portray an image of pervasion of on the side of the calendars, while praising the mainstream Sufi Sheikh, Usmani Rumi, as being both compassionate first, trying to bring him back, and, and firmly anti-heretic later on, when he was actually firmly anti this heresy. On the other hand, uh, Farisi portrays the Sheikh Uthman as an embodiment of the religious establishment to which Savi rebels by abandoning material life and embracing ascetic life. The contrast between uh, the two sources approach to the anecdote can be used as a reflection of two different parts of 13th and 14th century Anatolian society, where tensions between a religious establishment that appears to have accepted, to some extent, mainstream Sufism is being challenged by a new form of religiosity represented by the calendars and other mendicant dervishes. So that's what I, I think this comparison of this particular anecdote, which is very similar in the events and the narration of events, but with this twist, I think we can extrapolate some conclusions out of that. So what happened to these calendars after um, the 13th century? Well, from the 15th century onwards, the situation changed, and antinomian Sufi groups like the calendars, the Haidaris, the Abdals of Rumi, even who uh, are different because they, they mostly produce literature in Turkish rather than in Persian, um, the Jamis or the Shamsi Tabrisis will end up more or less amalgamated into a consolidation of the Bektashi official Sufi order of the Ottomans in the 16th century. Now, this is not the place to analyze in depth the centralization process of all these uh, mendicant dervishes into a more mainstream Sufism, but it appears that in, the con in, in this context, the description made by the author of the Fustat al Adala on the heterodoxies of Islam, esoteric movements in general, and on the calendars in particular, might have attracted some attention in the 16th century Ottoman court, which uh, in a way explained why the manuscript was copied in this, in this period. Um, so further, when, when Andrew Newman invited me to, to, to present on, on this workshop, I was, uh, I was working in Istanbul, and he asked me to if I could go further into the later period of the calendars, not to just focus on the 13th century, and while I was working to, I was walking to Suleymaniyya Library from the, uh, from the tube station, I found this. Um, so I thought it was relevant to show you that in modern times, uh, there are still traces of the calendars in the architecture of modern Istanbul. The building uh, was clearly an Orthodox church that still maintained its classical Greek, uh, Greek plan, one of the few that maintains a Greek plan. And it appears that has been given by Sultan Mehmed II in 1453, after the conquest of Constantinople to the calendars, uh, in order to be used as a sawiya and also as a public kitch uh, kitchen. And then it was consecrated as a mosque in the 18th century, but ever since the 15th century, it was known as the calendar Hane. So very clear, you know, we're not an art historian at all, so we might tell you more about people in the audience here. But uh, and also it's interesting that it has one of the earliest depiction of Francis of Assisi was in this church. Apparently depicted in, uh, in the first half of the 13th century. So I think uh, St. Francis died in 1226, if I'm not wrong. So uh, one of the earliest depictions we have is in the archaeological museum, so it's not in the, in the mosque, but they move it to the archaeological museum of Istanbul. So to conclude, the Fustat uh, description of the calendars, despite its critical and biased presentation, uh, offers a unique insight into these antinomian dervishes, their practices and attitudes toward them in 13th and 14th century Anatolia. The description is made by a member of the Anatolian high classes who tries to prevent the incipient local ruler of a spread of what is, in his view, a subversive and dangerous heresy that originated in Iran but is permeated into Anatolia. Yet in doing so, he gives voice to uh, this still subaltern social group uh, and leaves a unique description of the calendar's practices and beliefs. 
The similarities with the official hagiography of the calendars, given that it preceded by 50 years, offer a special opportunity for comparison and to know better the origin of these mendicant dervishes at an early stage of their identity formation, when they were still defining their set of beliefs and practices, subverting the Sharia and opposing the religious and secular establishment. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. That was really very interesting. Uh, two things, if I may. First one, this image of St. Francis of Assisi. Yes. We note that he's got no eyebrows, very little facial hair. <laughs> Interesting. That's a good point. Yes. Well, he seems to have the, you know, the, the, the distinctive Franciscan thing, but it's, it's true as well. It's an interesting point, yes. Uh, and secondly, and perhaps more seriously, um, does the text say much more about their beliefs as opposed to their practices? Because yes. I mean, in, in this period, as you know, in the 13th century, I mean, I think it's difficult to really talk about a single form of Sufism. Correct. And uh, when we look at what, how, how the calendar have been presented, there's an awful lot about practice, but very little about belief. Yes. I mean, okay. you mentioned, for example, they were described as worship in yes. planets. Yes, in very general terms. But you, you can see elements of this, for example, or how the Din is, is, is criticized for, for gazing at the moon. Right. Yes, but that's actually from practice, from beliefs, that's more or less the only thing that comes in the text. Uh, the Fustat goes over and over about the practices. And very much, I mean, I guess also it's a question of how the text might illustrate better to the reader as well, because it's much more fun to read about how these guys were going around and naked and, was, oh, and everybody's like, oh, God, you know. And rather than going into details into theological, especially in the 13th century. This work, again, is produced for a Turkmen ruler of Kastamonu, who probably is, you know, not that Islamized himself even. Um, so that depiction of the calendars and depiction of the calendars. And Karam Mustafa used it a, a bit as well. Uh, yeah, so I've been working this text for some time. I think all the other parts of the text also add to this, uh, but that will be for another, another discussion. Yeah. Uh, I'll go back to the Inez, because she yeah. Just a quick one, really, just um, because this sounds like something composed with the intention of mm -hmm. discrediting them, like so many works like that, and they appear earlier and much later as well in the Ottoman context. Mm -hmm. How much of it is, is, is true? How can we tell? How can well, we tell that any of it is true? Well, because I, I a lot of can. the bits that you quote actually yeah. sound like a lot of later, word for word, later texts composed on Zanadik yes, and Zindix in the Ottoman Yes, Empire. correct. That's, that's quite striking. I mean, in the sense that if it's, that's the case and they were repeating, this is the earliest, the earliest accounts we have. Okay. So in any case, the, the, all the other ones that came after were just repeating what exactly. this is Exactly, because we have come across texts that say the same sort of things in, in yeah. the exact same words, Correct. the kind of zindigs that appear mm -hmm. in our time, be aware of what they're doing yes. in their practices, Definitely. and even repeat the practices yes. which are not necessarily true Correct. and have sometimes been proven not to well, be true. That's, that's a good point. I, I, I don't think we can claim that this is what exactly they did, and in fact, all these things that they put in the dock inside the mosque, they have a lot of like uh, meaning to extrapolate from that beyond the story itself. I mean, the important thing is not the fact that the dog was or not inside the mosque, yeah. it's that the represent of the, I think, the establishments that were around. Now, but how they, the small mainstream or the establishment saw them with this terrified about them, produced these anecdotes, but which are then typified or copied in order to represent this fear of you know, heresy spreading and the end of the war and so on. The, it's important the audience, as you said, who is this writing for? Exactly. And all the time, the source, I only instructed this part for, for this talk, but all the time the work is saying the fault for this, the responsible for this, is the lack of control of the secular rulers, because this is being written for a new ruler that is trying to build her own local dynasty. So what you have to do is to combat context, these heresies. Yeah and the lack of the ulama who are just concerned about money, to specifically say, about money and unpure thoughts and practices as well, who he doesn't specify. But uh, so this is a reflection of that. And then definitely the stories are used for that purpose of the audience. Uh, I don't, I'm not claiming that this is mm. what was going on exactly, but probably, uh, I think the one in the namaz on the praying, that might be probably something destructive for more a real thing of one or two cases of his services going crazy. and you know, skipping the queue and entering the mosque and performing some sort of like, you know, 
But I don't know but much don't know. about the political uh, kind of connotations, uh, political context of that at that particular time. So yes. maybe you could just tell us a bit how does it fit into this? Why why is why was there such well, fear of as I said, what, yes. Were they an actual genuine threat at the time to the ruler of Castamonu? Well, in, in yes, in principle, uh, in Castamonu at this time there was this local uh, dynasty which uh, the Chobanolo, the Chobanits. Um, who were the, the, the founder of the dynasty, Husami uh, Chuban, was uh, appointed ruler or Sipak Salar of Kastamonu in the uh, 1220 something by the Seljuk ruler. Then the, and they were allies to the Seljuks. And then the Mongols come and everything shakes. And by the 12th, there is a gap, but we don't know much between the invasion of the Mongols and the 1270s. I'm trying to investigate further that. But then the Chobanis get involved in the uh, internal struggle among the Seljuks of Rum, supporting uh, Mahmoud, um, Mesut II, who eventually will rule in the, in the 1280s, and then he will go and they will come back in the 14th century. And they consolidate their power uh, there. The ruler of Castamono, Musafar al Din, supposedly went to Tabriz even to meet Ahmad Teguder, who uh, then when Teguder dies and Argun confirms his position, so he goes back and he's trying to build his own Power. One of my, the, the, this is part of the project I'm, I'm working on. There are other texts producing Castamon in this period, especially uh, Hussam al Din uh, Kui, which has uh, works on Insha or epistolary letters, so basically manuals so to tell people how to address rulers. So, this is another set of works which are actually telling us that the rulers of Castamon are trying to commission works that are telling us how to build some sort of uh, an, an empire or a kingdom. Um, you know, they are trying to build themselves a transgeneration to connect to other rulers and so on. And this might be a part of it, that which, like, you know, well, this is the, the thing you have to do at home and then the transgeneration to address other rulers. So there is a, a, a state building process, I believe, in this period. And this text has to be seen in this context yeah. of things you have to do exactly. in the realm. Um, because you. up to now, it is all wrong and it's all going to, you know, nowhere. And there's an interesting paragraph connecting them with the great Seljuks as well and how everything was great in the time of Alp Arslan and how everything went to hell since. But now with Mesud, things are better, he says that. Uh, so he quotes the, Sultan, the Seljuk of Rum Sultan Mesud as uh, saying that now, now we are getting better because Mesud is in power, who is the overlord of his own patrons, obviously. But that's the context, I'm sorry. Um, thank you very much for this. I, um, I had two, um, it's quasi-questions. One of them is, about this, what appears to be, with this last comment also, a, a topos of heresy, and mm -hmm. it seems to have its own place in multiple locations mm -hmm. and perhaps even across time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that by focusing on practice rather than belief, mm -hmm. perhaps, it actually, and I wonder if that's how you might see it also, that by focusing on practice and subversive um, actions mm -hmm. in social context, that the belief becomes so much less an issue. In fact, it's um, a non-issue mm -hmm. in, in many ways in, in looking at the Qalandars. Yeah. And finally, I wonder if this, you said that Qalandar Khanek that you've, you came across in yes. Istanbul was or is of a 15th century uh, sort of gift of Mehmet. That's what I read. I didn't pursue this much. Okay. Maybe you know you know better about. That's what I read. No, no, I don't know better. Yeah. What, what I'm interested in yeah. is the fact that that such a space actually is Correct. like a containment yes, of sir. sorts, yeah. and that many of the Khanavas seems seem mm -hmm. to have functioned in terms of here is a space you can do whatever you want to yeah. do in there. I think it's part of this centralizing process. Right. I don't know much about this 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 period of, of Ottoman. I just brought it up because. It was surprising when I was thinking about this paper, I just saw the Kandar Hane and said, okay, this is a mystical connection here. But, <laughs> uh, but certainly there is a process, which I understood correctly, of centralization of all these different um, understanding of Sufism into a more mainstream Sufism controlled by the Sultans and uh, the Ottoman Sultans. And I think this is part of that, a given place to have them under control in a way. Uh, but I'm not an specialist on that. So, but but there's defin there's definitely was a was a gift but uh, it's to them. Hanabas, the whole business of building Hanabas, which I can marry yes. to, can they be fixed? Well, that, I, mean, I, think, I think there is a, a strong connection between this, uh, this, 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 this uh, rulers seeing the potential uh, of, 
of these Sufis as connecting them with the people as well. And I think it will be, you know, they have to address that. And I think, um, referring to the first part of your, of your questions, I mean, the fact that they, they stress on practice is because also of the audience, as she was saying. And, and imagine this ruler of Castamonu going into oh, free will and predestination. She just mentioned it to say, oh, well, they're just heretics. But I don't think it will be interesting into the discussion about their beliefs and getting into like any, you know, uh, and he goes straight into the practices because it's the illustrative part of they are wrong and using possibly a lot of topos. But also the, the one of the sections that I don't mention here is the one that Osman Saran thinks is completely relevant is number five. Number five, who's not transcribed by Turan, uh, is a whole, he used the, what he, the, all the practices, the description of the practice he does before. And then they put, he put them in context with uh, Hanafi and Shafi law. And he say, Hanafi says that this is wrong, and Shafi agrees. And Han, Hanafi says this is wrong, and Shafi agrees. And so I think there is also another layer of, of issue here, that is the confrontation between Hanafi and Shafi uh, perceptions of, of, of Islamic law in Anatolia in these periods going on. So this, the calendars is also, are also used as a set of examples that can be used later on as a way to say, probably this author coming from Iran being more Shafi uh, tendencies, addressing to a Turk, uh, Turk uh, ruler who most probably is, has more Hanafi tendencies and trying to put them both together. So this is another part that I'm trying to investigate, which is quite tough. But I think this, the calendar play a role there as examples of how to illustrate to this audience that you see, that this all those heretic practices, but the real Islamic law, the orthodoxy, if you wish, will be either Hanafi or Shafi, who are the two only ones acceptable, according to the text. Mm -hmm. uh, it puts them all together again. So I think that's the, the, also a role that plays this topos into the narrative of the work. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.